What's up, peeps? Welcome. This is the Ebb and Flow Podcast. It's me, ex-NFLer turned yogi, Ebb Britain. Um, That will be official, as if it takes anything to be a yogi, anything tangible. Um, I am about to embark on a five-week, 300-hour yoga training program. Pretty fucking stoked about it. This is the Vishnu Ghosh method. I suppose that would be the ultimate term, formerly known as Bikram Yoga, Hot Yoga, the 26 and 2 practice. So I'm pretty stoked about it. Um, I'll keep you guys posted on all of that. That being said, this is. We're on our way winding down to the end of season two of the Ebb and Flow podcast. Going to run out a few more episodes. So keep this in mind as uh, we're going forward. And then with the season finale of uh, the Ebb and Flow for season two, following that, we're going to do a little run of the best of the Evan Flow podcast. Some of my favorite episodes, some of what I feel are perhaps either capture the essence of what the Evan Flow is or a very impactful conversation that I feel deserves revisiting. So stay tuned for that. Best of episodes coming at the end of season two. Also, Got some great new stuff from my dudes at Bioptimizers. Um, so when we talk about blood sugar, you might think when you hear that term that it has specifically to do with people suffering from diabetes or if you don't have diabetes or any other sort of insulin response or resistance issues, then you don't really need to think about your blood sugar. However, this would be a mistake. Blood sugar is a vital part of our health and well-being, a balanced blood sugar. It's it's very important for optimal health. Um, think about the last time you ate a big heavy meal of fried foods or processed foods or a a donut or a big plate bowl of ice cream covered in chocolate fudge or a Big Mac or whatever it might have been. And following that meal, for me when I was a teenager, it would have been a stack of pancakes and still to this day. And following that meal, you feel that just absolute crash. You're exhausted. You're ready for a nap. (laughs) So what happens is your pancreas releases insulin, which tells your body there's plenty of energy. So now is the time to store fat. And part of that experience, that that cascade of chemicals in your body is your energy gets just thrown into a complete disaster. And that has to do with an imbalance in your blood sugar due to the the insulin release. So... When you take in a lot of carbs too quickly without much fiber or fat to slow down absorption, you could experience what we call the sugar crash. Leads to low energy, brain fog, weight gain. For me, I experience a lot of depression. And due to the addictive nature of sugar and carbs, once your body brings your blood sugar levels back down, that's when the cravings kick in. Because all of a sudden you're like, holy shit, I need more. I need more. Your body needs to fill that energy void. And when you give in to those cravings, it starts all over again. So one of the ways to reduce your intake of carbohydrates, make sure you can obviously make sure you eat plenty of fat and protein and fiber and greens at most meals. So now from Bioptimizers, we've got a fantastic product, Blood Sugar Breakthrough. It's easy to take. It is the result of numerous tests to find the absolute best formula for maintaining healthy blood sugar. 
In fact, bioptimizers went through five different formulations before landing on this one. Blood sugar breakthrough works to safely lower blood sugar after meals so that you can maintain a healthy weight and redirect carbs to your muscles where they can be burned for energy. This means you'll avoid the worst effects of high blood sugar, like weight gain in particular, while enjoying more stable energy, mental clarity, and fewer cravings. I have started taking this on a cheat day. For me, a cheat day is like sweet potatoes. Maybe I'll have some keto ice cream. Um, But I've started taking this stuff, and I definitely notice a difference the next day when I wake up. I feel, I don't feel as though I just put on four pounds of fat. I feel as though I'm still lean. I'm still ready to rock and roll. So, highly recommend it. Awesome stuff. Give it a shot. Powerful for balancing the blood sugar, which in the end will optimize your health. You can head over to bloodsugarbreakthrough.health forward slash ebb and flow. Save 10% with code ebb and flow 10. And that's about it, folks. Head over there. That link will be in the bio. Uh, This conversation, one of the most powerful and important conversations I have ever had about food. It's with the carnivore MD, Dr. Paul Saladino. He is... He's fucking awesome, I have to say. And, And this conversation is highly illuminating as it relates to nutrition and food as medicine. Food is medicine. So, stoked to share it with you guys. All right, y'all. Well, I hope you guys have an excellent rest of your day living in your power, living in your truth. We need you. Until next time, I'll see y'all on the flip side. Enjoy this episode of The Ebb and Flow. Ah, excuse me. Before I let you go, would love to see you join the Power Tribe on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash EDS Britain. Love to see you there offering one-on-one coaching sessions. Um, and we have merch if you're interested, higherpowerworkshop.com for your revolutionary garb, your shroud of awakening waits for you at higherpowerworkshop.com. All right, y'all, that's enough. Enjoy this episode. It's a good one. See y'all on the flip side. Peace. You have unlocked the eternal link to internal source. The key of imagination. Your admission. Access to the enlightened dimension. The gateway at the junction of darkness and light. The place at which the chaos of our conditioned frame of mind give way to a life in constant flux, only to be mastered through vigilant discipline. Peaceful times may come, testing times may go. This is the ebb and flow. The Carnivore MD. Dr. Paul Saladino, excellent to have you on the ebb and flow, my brother. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure. Absolutely, dude. Um, well, I have a lot of thoughts and my own personal experience I'd like to reflect with you on, but I'd love to start with how you came into the carnivore philosophy like what was your life path getting to this point where you believed that meat is medicine essentially i think that from an early age i had this fascination with food Mm. and the ability of food to affect uh, the quality and the experience of our lives Uh, i along that path i had a lot of wrong turns Um, But I've always been fascinated by the ability of food to affect us as humans, mostly within the sphere of my own life experience. And I had some had some detours. You know, I was a vegan, a raw vegan for seven months, Mm. maybe 13 or 14 years ago. And I remember even before that, when I was a kid, I had this 
fat obsession uh, and I would only eat low fat foods. And so I ate a ton of cereal and skim milk. Uh, I was raised in a, in, a, in a medical family. My dad was a doctor and my mom was a nurse practitioner. So I had this connected with that. I had this real interest in, I guess, human quality of life and chronic mm. illness. And mm. when I would ask my dad, like the most prominent disease that I was aware of as a child was a heart attack. Mm. And that was the thing that everybody said, everybody knew you didn't want to get that. Even as a 10 year old, I could understand that heart attacks were bad. Right. And so I asked my dad, an, an internal medicine physician, what causes heart attacks? And he said, nobody knows. And I thought, mm. even as a 10 year old, I kind of knew. <laughs> That's, that's kind of bullshit, right? Like this guy is my dad. He works all the time. <laughs> he went to medical school. He went to residency. All he does is work. And he doesn't even know what causes heart attacks. How is this even true? You know, it's crazy. So it was kind of from there that I, that I really began thinking about the way that food could influence human health. And I had my own medical issues that were at the center of it, center of it, specifically eczema and asthma. And eczema, mm. for people that don't know, is like these little red itchy bumps that you get on your skin. I would get them on my wrists or my elbows, my fingers, or my waist. Sometimes I would get it other places like my hips or my butt or my other place, or I don't know, my knees. But it's, it's annoying because it's itchy. Um, it, it prevents you from doing things you want to do because it can get super infected if you're on mats, doing jujitsu or other martial arts. And it's just, it's clearly an indication that your immune system is, is not happy with something that you are doing. But if you mm. go to a mainstream dermatologist, they'll just tell you, oh, here's a steroid cream right. to take. And, or here's an oral steroid, or here's a biological agent that's uh, gonna modify the way your immune system works orally. And that was always unsatisfactory to me. And I always, I was already connecting the dots early on. Like, I'm pretty sure it's a food that I'm eating that's triggering my eczema. But if you ask dermatologists, they'll say, oh no, there's no evidence that that's the problem. And you think, man, I, medicine is bullshit. <laughs> medicine is bullshit. <laughs> so, you know, I, I kind of struggled with my own issues, uh, trying to both optimize my physical and mental performance in my life. And, and then also trying to avoid my eczema. And like I said, I meandered down some wrong turns, like raw veganism, which resulted in 25 to 30 pounds of lean muscle mass loss uh, to the point that I was basically cachectic and super skinny. And mm. then um, after that, I was paleo and had a lot more muscle. Hold on one sec, I'll pause it here. Got a little, sounds like you've got tanks rolling in the back. <laughs> this is so good, Paul. It resonates with me deeply because for much of my childhood, I always, I always had this intuitive sense that food could help me improve the quality of my life so it's really powerful to hear you talk about that especially coming from your background this medical background yeah so with with a paleo diet i gained muscle back and i felt better and i was eating meat vegetables fruit basically your listeners will probably be familiar with the philosophy of a paleolithic diet, which starts to look uh -huh. evolutionarily at what humans should be eating and leaves out things like grains and beans and dairy, which appear to be relatively recent introductions into the human um, menu over the last 10,000 years or so. But for the majority of human evolution, it looks like we were not eating a lot of those foods. So paleolithic diet philosophy says, oh, let's leave those things out and focus on the things that we were probably eating for millions of years. So that helped me somewhat. I gained some muscle back. I felt a little better. I farted less, but still farted a lot. When I was a vegan, I farted a ton. I had the worst gas in the world as a vegan. Um, and it was just, it was impossible literally to be around me in any closed space as a vegan. And 
you know, a, a paleolithic diet helped, but I still had eczema. At times, the eczema oh. got to be so bad that it was that it was over my whole body, my chest, my back. And in medical school, my eczema got really bad, and I that was when I started doing jujitsu, and I couldn't do it all the time because I was on the mats. Uh, and then into residency at the University of Washington, I still had eczema. I remember at one point in my second or third year of residency at the University of Washington, I was was eating a lot of these like quote unquote medicinal mushrooms because they were in vogue. So I was doing like reishi powder and chaga uh -huh. and lion's mane powder. And uh, temporally, the association there is enough to make me suspect that those caused one of the worst eczema flares I've ever had in my life. And if anyone knows about eczema, it lasts a long time. It doesn't just mm. come and go in a day. It usually lasts for weeks. It takes a long time to go away because your immune system, the way it gets triggered, it's involving T cells and, and T cells take a long time to calm down. Uh, and some of the antigens and these these T cells that are activated against a specific antigen can take weeks or you know a month, two months to really get out of your system, even when the offending food or antigenic substance has been removed. So I had a horrible eczema flare my second or third year of residency, and I thought, man, what am I doing? I'm eating almost entirely organic food. I'm eating salads. I'm eating plants. I'm eating vegetables, and I'm eating fruit, and I'm eating meat. Why is my eczema still bad? And I'm eating these mushrooms. Uh, I'm still having flares. And these are all things that are widely considered to be healthy. And, mm. and I thought, okay, I'm just going to eliminate all the plants from my diet. I heard Jordan Peterson on Joe Rogan's podcast talking about the improvements in his autoimmune disease, the improvements in his daughter's autoimmune disease, when they just ate a diet of all meat. And at this point, I had gone back to medical school after being a physician assistant in cardiology for four years. And I went back to medical school with the intention of understanding the root cause of illness. And so I was already kind of hip to ideas around functional medicine and integrative medicine. And in those schools of thought, plants and plant chemicals are very valuable for humans. And so there was a lot of cognitive dissonance in my mind thinking, this is crazy. I can't just eat meat. Uh, there's all these things that are important in, in vegetables that I, that I will need that I will lack. But, you know, I researched it a little more and I said, you know what, I like trying new things. I'm going to do it. And I cut out all the plants from my diet. And lo and behold, the eczema resolved, got better, never reoccurred for years until I tried to reintroduce certain plant foods that, that trigger it uh, years later. And in addition to the res resolution of the eczema, I also felt differently psychologically, which was fascinating to me. I sort of felt more calm and focused. And that isn't really attributable to ketosis. We can talk about ketosis and my views on that, because in the beginning of my carnivore diet, um, just the first couple of weeks, I was eating meat and organs, but I also included honey because I didn't want to go into ketosis. I was in my residency and I had never spent much time in ketosis. And I thought, you know what, the transition to a ketogenic state is challenging for people. I'm going to eat honey as well. So I was eating honey and meat and organs, um, like liver and heart in the beginning. And my mental state got better, like psychologically. I just felt less likely to like honk at somebody in traffic, less, less agitated. And I was living in Seattle at the time. It's kind of a stressful place. It's gloomy, sure. it's rainy, there's a lot of traffic. So I was like, man, there's something to this. I feel good. Like my libido improved, my energy stayed really good. Eventually I pulled back from the honey and for the next year and a half, I just ate uh, meat, organs and animal fat. And then eventually I transitioned to what I do now, which I would consider to be more animal based. So the majority of my diet is meat and organs and animal fat with some inclusion of the least toxic plant foods. And we can talk about why I made that transition. The least toxic plant foods being things like fruit and honey, but I still don't eat vegetables. And I've sort of self dubbed myself. I've come to think of myself as like an anti vegetable crusader and sort of trying to point out this, 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 this relationship that many of us have with vegetables, we've been told they're so good for us, but I'm not convinced that they are. And when you think about it from the perspective of a plant, it starts to make a lot of sense. So there's varying degrees of focus on animal foods that I think we can do as humans. And all of them can be beneficial for some people. I think that ultimately um, what I've learned through the last three plus years of this has been that number one, that animal meat and organs are clearly the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. They're clearly the most nutrient bioavailable rich foods on the planet, and they are incorrectly maligned. They are incorrectly denigrated by the mainstream media based on really shitty science, really shitty consideration of the science that's out there. They're, they're what we've always sought as humans. 
especially as, as hunting and gathering humans. And then yeah. beyond that, um, there are a lot of foods that we are told are good for us or that are told that are not bad for us, like seed oils, things like corn, canola, safflower, sunflower, soybean, et cetera, which are extremely bad for humans. And we can talk about that um, because of evolutionary inconsistency. And then the third premise is really that even within hunter-gatherer tribes uh, alive today, like the Hadza, who I visited in Tanzania and the Ikum, mm. the Kungsan in, in Botswana and Namibia, there is a hierarchy. There is a relative appreciation of plant foods, meaning that they tend to look at plant foods in a similar way and think of which plant foods are more palatable, less toxic, more calorically rich, and more digestible, those being fruit, than the other parts of plants which we technically think of as vegetables. So we can talk about all that. There's a lot to unpack there. That was a long answer to your question. No, dude, that was so awesome. That was so great. Um, fuck, man. Well, I'll say that for, I played professional football six years in the NFL. I have had a very intimate relationship with food throughout my life. Uh, as a kid, growing up in a household where there was a lot of chaos, food became a comforting agent, a numbing agent. Um, and then as I shifted into my football career, food became fuel. So I looked at food as this necessity to feed my muscles and my body so that I could be as productive on the football field as I possibly could be, strong, resilient, etc. Then when I got into the NFL, started dealing with a lot of pain and injuries, physical and emotional trauma, food switched back to, it was sort of this melange of comforting agent slash fuel, but really veered more into what makes me feel good, which ended up being a lot of like pasta and steaks and lobster tails and potatoes and all kinds of shit. Um, but you know, through that whole process, I learned so much about what various foods did in my body when I put them in. For instance, when I eat grains or gluten in any form, my fucking every joint in my body hurts. I just had an experience this weekend. We went to a movie. I had literally like two beers and a sweet potato bun, even after taking these uh, gluten guardian enzymes that I get from Bioptimizers, I still, dude, on Monday, I was fucked. Like my body was so stiff and tight. And I was like, this is why I don't eat this shit, you know? And through that process, I've really veered into carnivore because for whatever reason, or I, you know, for very specific reasons, I've learned that I suffer from some sort of autoimmune issue. My mother does as well. I know that. I had this test done. I, I'm, you're probably familiar with it. It's called the Cyber Scan. It's a German medical device that you put your hand on this platform for about 10 seconds, and it does a whole scan of your energy field, and it spits out a reading of literally every you could have done a blood test, a CAT scan, an MRI, and it spits out an, a complete diagnostic of your physical and energetic health and psychological, actually. And it blew my mind because it was so to a T correct, and I had filled out no forms. This is with this, this Sikh yogi out in uh, West L.A. His name's Dr. Har Hari Khalsa. Next level shit has like Tesla coils in his place, all kinds of cool stuff. But it spit out this reading that was so on point. And one of the things it said was basically that I suffer from something that could be akin to lupus. And uh, which makes so much sense for me and just my life dealing with various, like those, those very subtle energy uh, fluctuations and not so subtle energy fluctuations, like feeling really tired at times for no apparent reason. Um, feeling like I can never get rested, feeling really achy in my joints. My mother who has, you know, had another adventure with food who I've learned a lot from as well. 
uh, she's she's basically a pre-diabetic, and her food has gone from she's tried vegan, she's tried you know keto, she's and through my experience, I've shifted her much more into an animal-based way of eating, and she eats like hardly anything at this stage. She basically lives on air and water, and like you know, and super health. You know, she's she's a a phenom, honestly. Um, but, you know, to that point, it has always occurred to me that food was the answer to pretty much any ailment that I was dealing with, physically at least. And intuitively, I moved into, I moved after my football career, I moved into a ketogenic based diet, high fat, moderate protein. I was probably eating a little more than moderate protein, very low carb, basically took all carbs out felt amazing, shed like 50 pounds of fat, put on more lean muscle mass than I've ever had, felt energized, felt really good and healthy. But that sort of ran its course as well. And I felt like I moved through the place where it had, it had, it had lost its efficacy. And then, um, of course my dog is barking at the FedEx truck. Um, but so then, you know, I start looking at guys like Dr. Sean Baker. I hear Joe Rogan talking about it. Uh, Jordan Peterson, I come across you. And I'm like, you know, there's something to this thing, man. I know it sounds totally crazy. This idea that you could just eat meat because it's totally counter to everything. We're always all the information that's just shoved in our face about how important vegetables are how destructive meat is to our body and our arteries and all of this shit and cholesterol levels and all of the stuff and the saturated fat. But I'm looking at the people who are the carnivores and I'm going, these people look fucking healthy. They look vibrant. They look happy. They're not just talking shit. This isn't just like go eat meat. And you know, it's like very dialed in of what these guys are talking about. So I started experimenting with it and also having this intuitive sense that I've always felt best when I eat meat. I just always feel like meat has never been a thing that has caused me more inflammation or caused me more brain fog or whatever it is. So then I follow this guy, Carnivore Aurelius, too, who's hilarious, but he's got great information. And he starts posting about beef liver and then... Um, also, my dude, Food Lies, Brian, uh, he's talking about beef liver or just liver in general, how liver is the most nutritious food on the planet. So about a month ago, I've been on the carnivore vibe. I go to this Mediterranean restaurant with my brother and they have lamb liver and onions on the menu. And I'm like, I'm fucking getting that. I got two plates of lamb liver and onions. And I ate one plate. I ate this. Paul, I walked out like I had had a fucking energy drink. I was like, I've never felt this way in my life. Energized, powerful, mind clear, sharp. I've never felt that way after eating a meal, perhaps in my entire life. And so, of course, a couple of weeks ago, I'm like, they got fucking grass-fed organic local beef liver at Whole Foods right now. I'm like, give me a couple pounds of that. So I brought it home. I started eating it for lunch, man, and it's the same thing. I'm like, oh, again and again. I eat it, I eat it and I feel like I had the most powerful energy drink I've ever had in my life. And so then I come across your post about honey and fruit. And meanwhile, I've been doing a ton of hot yoga I'm preparing to do this uh, yoga 300-hour te yoga teacher training. Yoga's in my blood. I love it so much. But the hot yoga, I started just intuitively. I'd come home from the yoga and I'd eat fruit. And it, it gave me this energy boost. And for a long time, probably for honestly the last five years, I've been thinking to myself, oh, I can't eat fruit. I don't eat fruit. I won't eat fruit. It doesn't digest well or it doesn't, it requires separate enzymes and digestive juices to break it down or else it ferments and it causes all kinds of issues. I don't eat fruit. I don't fuck with it. 
But then I just sort of intuitively started eating it after hot yoga. It gave me this energy boost. And then I see your post talking about honey, organ meats, and fucking fruit. And it'll send a signal to your body of living in abundance. And just after that post, I saw it probably a week ago, I started having a spoonful of honey after my workouts. And I'd like to talk to you about timing and all of that stuff too, but dude, it's like the missing ingredient. (laughs) I'm fucking, I'm like, I stumbled into the fucking, you know, temple of God in food, man. Like what the fuck? It's blowing my mind. So I don't know. I I mean, there's so much, yeah, so much to unpack there. Let me just, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much done as far as, you know, bringing you up to speed on my food experience. But, you know, I feel like, you know, there's so much I want to, I want to talk to you about. I mean, like you said, you go into a doctor's office and whatever ailment you're suffering from, if you ask them if, if it has anything to do with what you're eating, you get laughed out of the fucking office. It's like, what is the deal, man? In medical school, uh, you don't learn about nutrition, right? I mean, uh, you don't. where do we begin, man? <laughs> well, let me, <laughs> there were a lot of things that you talked about there that I want to unpack for people a little bit, which is really great. So the first thing that you mentioned that I think that's important to highlight is that autoimmune disease is an epidemic. And I think that, you know, most, if not all chronic illness is autoimmune in nature. You Uh can even make a reasonable case that heart disease and heart attacks are autoimmune because the way that atherosclerosis happens in the subintimal layer of a blood vessel is with the intrusion or the you know, the, uh, the ingression, the arrival of macrophages, which are an immune cell, which then take up, uh, you know, lipid LDL particles. Mm. And we can go deeply down the LDL rabbit hole and why LDL itself does not cause uh, atherosclerosis later on, if you would like. But uh, the, the basic gist is that LDL particles appear to be oxidized or they appear to be in a place that they shouldn't be, they get stuck on the proteoglycans and the subintimal layer, and they get stuck there too long, and then the macrophages take them up and they end up as foam cells, and that's the beginning of an atherosclerotic plaque. But you have the involvement of the immune system even in Mm. atherosclerosis, even in the precursors of heart disease, things like eczema, joint pain, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is usually a hypothyroid condition, Graves' disease, uh, seborrheic dermatitis, psoriasis, loss of hair. For many people, there's, there's hair conditions which are autoimmune in nature. I mean, the list, you mentioned lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, the list of autoimmune disease, inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis is, is, is myriad. It's a huge right. list. And most, if not all, chronic illness is autoimmune in nature. I, even, even psychiatric illness demonstrates components yeah. of inflammation in the brain. And you can see macrophages, which in the brain are called microglial cells, changing their phenotype, meaning they turn on, they're activated. They're sort of like on high alert. This is the National Guard being called out in your brain, mm. in your brainstem, in your cerebrospinal fluid, in your spinal cord, people with multiple mm. sclerosis, people with dementia, people with Parkinson's disease. You see inflammation in the brain. So autoimmunity is everything. Autoimmunity, I think, underlies so many of the chronic illnesses that we suffer from as humans. But Western medicine doesn't quite get this. And I tweeted this the other day also that I really strongly believe and one of the goals of my work is to help, to nudge, to kick Western medicine in the ass until it starts to understand that dietary modification should be the first line treatment of autoimmune disease. Whether it's my eczema, your joint pain, somebody else's lupus, psoriasis, Sjogren's, whatever. Dietary modification should be the first line of treatment. And then the question is, okay, what type of diet should you put people on? And I honestly think that changing someone's diet is more important than what type of diet you put them on because any Uh type of intentional dietary choice will eventually, I believe, lead you down a path that gets you to healing. I chose Uh vegan first, it didn't work for me. I don't think it works for most people and we can explain why 
uh, in a moment. But I think that most people will arrive at something like an animal-based diet on their journey. But I just want people to begin the journey of modifying right. their food choices, looking for higher quality food and looking for food that's evolutionarily consistent when they find themselves with chronic illness, the majority of which is autoimmunity. So that's the first point I wanna make. The second point is that I think we can get so much information, we can get so much wisdom about the way that humans are supposed to eat from what our ancestors have done. And we can look at anthropology, which is why I talk about anthropology so much in my book, The Carnivore Code, and why I talk about anthropology so much on my podcast, which is called Fundamental Health, and why I talk about anthropology so much in everything I do, because, and that's why I went to visit the Hadza in Tanzania, because I think that these hunter-gatherer tribes that are still living are the best, the best extant reminder, the best, the best present time machine. It's the best version of the DeLorean from Back to the Future that we have. And we can go back 50 to 100,000 years by looking at the way they live because they actually still live as hunter-gatherers. Now, the, the Homo genus has been around for 2 million plus years with Homo erectus and Homo habilis. So when we go back that far, we don't have a great time machine. We don't have any Homo erectus or Homo habilis species left on the planet. Homo sapiens arose 350 to 500,000 years ago, but we have a lot of fossilized remains. And if you look at the majority of that, if you look at really the entirety of it, it all points to the same thing, which is the very simple fact that hunting animals and eating meat made us human. There was a really fascinating point in human evolution where Australopithecus, which is not a homo genus, it's an Australopithecine. It looks kind of like a monkey-human hybrid. If you saw an Australopithecus on the street, you wouldn't think it was a human. But if you saw Homo erectus or Homo habilis, you might just think it was a football player, right? So it's, you know, it's, or like, or like uh, I don't know, somebody like really burly or somebody with a really big yeah, jaw, yeah. who knows, right? Yeah. But an Australopithecine, an Australopithecine, you would not confuse them for a human. Well, Australopithecus appears to have had a, a, a branch point, uh, a divergence. And one arm led to Homo erectus and Homo habilis. And the other arm led to a species called Paranthropus robustus or Paranthropus boisei. And we never hear about the latter species because they went extinct. And mm. we can find fossilized remains of Homo erectus, Homo habilis, which is the Homo genus, our lineage, and then Paranthropus. And we can look at the teeth of those fossilized remains. And based on stable isotopes in the teeth, calcium, strontium, barium, we can get a sense of what those people, those pre-hominids, those, you know, those hominids were eating. And what you see really clearly is that Paranthropus was more of a plant eater. And Homo erectus and Homo habilis were more animal eaters, whereas Australopithecus was kind of in the middle. So this is a really fascinating off-ramp on the highway of human evolution. It doesn't get talked about enough. And oh. the, the end of the story is that, hey, guess what? Our plant-based ancestors went extinct. And our <laughs> animal-based ancestors, Homo habilis and Homo erectus, throw. You know, they were the ones that thrived. They were the ones that eventually became Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovans, because the way that we were going in our evolutionary lineage, having meat, the unique nutrients in meat, which are not found in plant foods, and there are many unique nutrients in meat that are not found in plant foods, meat and organs. I'm using the, sort of a, a broad definition of that. Things like choline, carnitine, uh -huh. creatine, K2, answerine, taurine, riboflavin, B12, the list goes on and on and on. These are not found in plant foods. Pyridoxine and like, you know, vitamin B6 in, in large amounts that's highly bioavailable. Large amounts of essential fatty acids like EPA and DHA, which are essentially absent from plant foods, um, other than alpha linolenic acid, which is not easily converted to EPA and DHA. But the, the takeaway is that these unique nutrients found in animal foods, along with the, the protein, the amino acids, the answering, the taurine, the carnitine, the choline, the carnosine, the creatine, allowed us to become human. They allowed our brains to grow with a shrinking gut. So our small intestines got, got larger, our large intestines got smaller, and we became people that can get a six pack as opposed to a protuberant abdomen of like an ape because we don't have to sit around all day eating leaves and fermenting them in our large intestine to make short chain fatty acids to get our nutrition. We can kill an animal or scavenge an animal that's already been killed and get all of these amazing nutrients. And we can even like use a rock as humans gaining intelligence or pre-humans, hominids gaining intelligence, crack into the skull and eat some brain. And that's gonna be a feast for us or crack bones and get bone marrow. And so this is where we've come from as humans. We have come from a lineage that was made human by eating meat. 
So just, just from that position, it's going to take anyone in the plant-based sphere a lot, of, a lot of effort to make any sensical argument about why we should stop eating meat now. And you have to view all of the studies that are, that are anti-meat in that context. And we can talk about why those studies are very misleading, primarily because they're epidemiology, they're observational studies based on surveys rather than actually intervention studies that are done with experiments. But we know, and I think that so much of this gets lost, that evolutionarily, where we've come from as humans is from people like the Hadza, like the Ikun, the Kungsan of, of Southern Africa. And what do they eat? Well, I went and visited the Hadza and I asked them this question, what is the most important thing in your life? And they said, meat. Well, what do you like mm. to do? We like to hunt. What is your favorite mm. food? It's eland, which is a 2000 pound impala. What else oh. do you like to eat? Bush pig, you know, baboons, and you know, whatever the biggest, the biggest animals they can get. That's all they say. They don't say we like to eat vegetables. They don't say we like right. to eat salads. They don't say we like Caesar dressing or any sort of bullshit, right? They definitely Shoots don't say they like straw. kale or broccoli. Yeah, like we don't, yeah. we don't like to eat, you know, we don't eat tree bark, you know? And so, and then you say, what do you dream about? Well, they dream about hunting. You ask yes. the women, what makes a good husband? A man who can, who's, a, who's a successful hunter. And, and then you, what do they do in their free time? They make bows and arrows, man. They make bows right. and arrows. They sit around the fire and they make bows and arrows. That's what they do. So their whole life, their whole life revolves around meat. It's not the only thing. You know, mm. they play music and they, you know, they, they joke around and occasionally they'll imagine- go look for some honey. I would imagine tell stories of the hunts they've been on. They do. And they have, they have prizes. They have, they have their prize skulls of the big animals they've killed around mm. the camp. They keep them to, you know, and they, they celebrate them and the people, they wear pelts, they wear skins from animals they've killed and they hang tails of genet cats on their belts to like, this is an animal that I killed. So their whole life is built around this, this story, the narrative of meat, it's central to their life. And then you can look, of course, at their health. They're incredibly cardiovascularly healthy. They eat a ton of saturated fat. They eat a ton of meat when they can get it. They're incredibly cardiovascularly healthy. They don't have diabetes. They don't have chronic disease. They don't get eczema. They don't get myopia, right? They don't have, they don't have achy joints. Like they don't have chronic illness like we do. Yeah, they don't have chronic illness like we do as humans. And then you can take it a step further because we have to answer the criticisms that always come up here. People say, yes, but they only live to be 35, which is a complete misunderstanding and a very uh, limited appreciation of the data of their life expectancy. So many of the life expectancies of these hunter gatherers are misrepresented as a combination of, uh, they're skewed by high rates of infant mortality. If you look at their health span, if you look at how long they live, if they make it to adulthood or teenage years, They live as long as us in the Western world, 70s, 80s, but they have much greater health long into their life. We call this squaring of the morbidity curve. They do not Mm. suffer from chronic decrepitude like we do. There is an inexorable march to decrepitude in the Western world. You know that like, uh, at least I've seen it, you know, my poor father, he just hunches over and he's more kyphotic and he's more kyphotic, he can't walk. He's he's limited, he's he's old, he's graying, he's frail. Uh, I worry he's gonna fall every day, he's 71. 71-year-old Hadza are still cutting meat off the bone and cooking it on a fire with guys 20 years younger than them or 30 years younger than them or 40 years younger than them. They might even go out in the bush and hunt a little bit. I mean, it's, it's a completely different world in these hunter-gatherer cultures. And yet, mm. this is so often ignored. But humans living in the wild do suffer from higher rates of infant mortality because if you've ever spent any time camping or living in the wild, you know it's dangerous. Yeah. And right. having a baby in a forest or a, in the bush means that the baby could step on a snake or fall off a rock, or you know maybe there are complications from the pregnancy, which happen every once in a while. So higher rates of infant mortality are a normal thing in hunter-gatherer cultures. And that's okay, that's normal. Um, it doesn't mean that they're less healthy. In fact, their health span dwarfs ours as westernized Americans. So that's a very long-winded response to all the things that you said, but I just wanted to comment on all of that and just point out that when we are thinking about the foods for humans, 
I think that we always are looking for a species appropriate diet. Like I said, these hunter gatherer cultures give us an indication of what our homo sapiens species has always eaten. My friends always joke with me about this when they find out what I do. They say, why are we the only species on the planet that doesn't know what it's supposed to eat? And it's probably because we've been fed bad science forever. Since the 1950s right. and 1960s, based on epidemiology and observational research, which just confuses the shit out of us. But our ancestors knew what to do. The Hadza knew what to do. And they clearly favor meat, and then they favor fruit, and they favor honey. And then way down the totem pole, if they don't have any food that's like really good, they might eat a pumpkin leaf. They might eat some tubers occasionally. They don't eat a ton of tubers. They don't really like them. There are tons of studies by Frank Marlowe and others showing the tubers are the least valuable thing for them. And they don't even include on the list things like vegetables. So vegetables are things like stems, roots, leaves, and seeds. The seeds being grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, which are all plant seeds. These foods don't even make it in the Hadza like top five, or even the top 10. Uh, it's mm. all berries and, and honey and occasionally tubers, but then the top ones are meat, you know, fruit when it's yeah. seasonal. That's what they really want to eat. And so as I was transitioning, maybe I'll just finish my story so people understand this a little bit. As I was transitioning, carnivore diet was really helpful, but kind of like you, ketosis ran its course with me. And I found that after a year and a half of being in ketosis, I was starting to get some pretty significant leg cramps. I was getting heart palpitations and I had pretty bad electrolyte issues. I do oh. think that humans have been in ketosis evolutionarily. There have been times when we are not eating carbohydrates or when we're just starving because we haven't had a successful hunt and we have a massive caloric deficit and we end up in ketosis. But I think that generally we try and stay out of ketosis as humans. This is where the idea of abundance signals comes in. We try and get meat, we try and get organs, we try and get honey and we try and get fruit. If those things are available, our ancestors are going to eat them. They're not gonna say, oh, it's too late in the day or oh, I'm gonna to fast today or oh, I'm doing my time restricted <laughs> feeding or oh, I wanna, let me check my ketones. You know, I don't wanna go below 2.0, my ketones, two millimolar. That's all bullshit, man. Your ancestors are gonna eat those foods if they come in contact with them. And so I do think ketosis can be helpful for people, especially if they have diabetes or pre-diabetes or you know, insulin mm -hmm. resistance, metabolic dysfunction, which is something else we can talk about. Ketosis can be helpful short-term, but long-term humans thrive on carbohydrates and the least toxic sources of, of carbohydrates are what I chose to incorporate into my diet. Things like honey and fruit, parts of the plant that don't have defense chemicals, that don't have anti-nutrients that are trying to prevent you from digesting it. That's what I chose to use as my source of carbohydrates. That's a real difference between the way that I eat my carbohydrates and the way that people on plant-based diets or a standard American diet are gonna eat their carbohydrates. And if you pair that with animal meat and organs, you basically have a diet that I believe strongly gives you a ton of nutrients with a, like essentially no toxins, no anti-nutrients. And that's the equation that I think we're all trying to solve for. How do I get the most nutrition with the least number of anti-nutrients, with the least number of toxins and plant defense chemicals? And so there's so many ways we can go from this and I'll let you direct the conversation from here, but it's not surprising that when you ate liver, you felt so good because there are so many unique nutrients in liver that you don't even yeah. get in muscle meat. There's things like more choline, more riboflavin, it just turns your brain on, right? And then yeah. when you're getting fruit, you're giving your body, again, this signal of abundance and honey, this signal of abundance at a molecular level. And specifically what it's doing at a molecular level, I'll say this and then I'll shut up, is you're getting an insulin spike, which is not something to fear. Uh, if you are an insulin sensitive individual, an insulin spike is healthy. Even if you're not insulin sensitive, and you're eating foods that are good for you, that are nutrient rich, and they're driving up your insulin, that's okay. But insulin is an important hormone for humans. It shouldn't be up all the time. But spikes of insulin right. are healthy. They're needed for proper electrolyte maintenance at the level of the kidney, which is why people in long-term ketosis get massive electrolyte issues. And they're also needed, spikes of insulin are also needed for proper hormonal health, proper antioxidant balance in the human body, meaning the production of our endogenous antioxidants, glutathione, superoxide dismutase, catalase, all of these things, they're all based on insulin. So you give your body signals of abundance. You basically tell your body, you just killed an animal and found a stash of honey and it's spring and there's tons of fruit everywhere. It's time for you to get strong and make babies. Uh, it's awesome, dude. It's awesome. Um, well, there's a few things I want to, I want to hit. Um, number one is the common vegan arguments of our teeth are not 
those of a meat eater and our digestive system is not that of a meat eater. Where do those arguments come from and how do they, uh, I mean, I have, I have my, uh, a thought that comes to me, especially about the digestive system, but, um, how do those arguments break down and why are those not based on anything that's real or perhaps what is real in those arguments and what is a false belief? Let's start with the digestive system because I think that that one is, is clearly incorrect. Um, the, the pH of our stomach is 1 to 1.5. That is a very acidic pH in the stomach. That is the mm. pH of a meat eater. That is the wow. pH of a species that evolved eating rotting flesh. You know, <laughs> that is the pH of a, of a, of a meat eating animal. There is no question about that. There are many adaptations in our physiology that are hunting adaptations. We have a very acidic stomach. Like I said, we have a very large small intestine, which is basically evolved to absorb highly nutrient dense foods like meat. And then we have a very large relative to our primate ancestors. We have very small, large intestine. Now the large intestine is where the plant food we eat is fermented and where apes uh, spend all of their day eating leaves and they really do eat you know, hours and hours and hours a day. Right. I think some people estimate 16 hours a day or more. Um, and they're filling their body, they're filling their protuberant commodious colons with plant matter that is then fermented into short chain fatty acids, which is where they get their energy. So the statement that our digestive tract doesn't look like a meat eater is completely false. There's really no evidence for that. It's actually clearly a meat eating uh, organisms digestive tract. And let me just say this one thing here because a lot of people get confused with this. When they hear that my handle is carnivore MD and I wrote a book called The Carnivore Code and I talk about the <laughs> carnivore diet, people get really dogmatic. And right, they think, right. wait a minute, this guy eats fruit and honey, he's an omnivore. And to which right, I say, right. absolutely, humans are omnivorous. But if you look at omnivorous species, it's very clear based on the research of zoologists that the majority, more than 70% of omnivorous species either lean heavily toward plant or animal consumption. So the question becomes, are humans a plant-based omnivore or an animal-based omnivore? And I think mm. that the evidence is overwhelming in favor of the latter. We are animal-based omnivores. And the idea of a carnivore diet and quickly or closely related an animal-based diet is that by becoming, by embracing the reality of your animal-based omnivory status as a human and making the majority of your diet meat and organs and then filling in the gaps with the least toxic plant foods, we thrive. When things are aligned, we thrive as humans. It's, that's how it works, right? Like when, when, um, when we eat like we are supposed to eat as humans, when we actually become the, the species that eats a diet that is species appropriate, we thrive as humans. And that's, that's the magic in it. So the second argument is about the teeth. Wait, Paul, and I can one, talk about, one thing. Yeah. Where, does, where does that come from? Is, that, is the argument about the digestive system from the vegan community, is that just a hopeful misinterpretation of what is, what is, is it just a complete illusion, fantasy, like trying to make an argument where there isn't one? Where do you think that comes from? I'm just curious. Because it Perhaps seems like you said, food is yeah. so dogmatic in, in, in this day and age. I think that perhaps they're comparing the digestive system of a human, an animal-based omnivore, to a pure carnivore like a cat. Mm, and mm, they're saying, okay. oh, they're different. They're slightly different. Well, they're slightly different, but our, our digestive tract looks a lot like a dog. And dogs are also animal-based omnivores. Um, cats are carnivorous. <laughs> They right. just eat meat, right? Animals, uh -huh. I mean, humans and dogs are animal-based omnivores, which is where the idea, the sense of an animal-based diet comes. We are animal-based gotcha. omnivores, right? And we can do very well eating just meat, um, which is the, you know, it's sort of the genesis of a carnivore diet. With our teeth, you have to remember that our predecessors evolutionarily are primates. Like right. we, you know, only 4 million years ago, we split off from chimpanzees and bonobos. It's not surprising that we have molars. 
that we have teeth that are evolved to grind fibrous foods, which have served us well over our evolution during times of animal scarcity. And so I will reiterate the fact that humans are animal-based omnivores, which means great. If you have a tribe and you hunt an animal, you are sitting pretty. You are happy, right. you are celebrating, you are making babies, <laughs> you are singing songs, you are eating the best food on the planet. But if you end up in a place where you can't eat animals or you're not successful, great. Because if you really need to, you can gather some tubers. You can eat some plant leaves if you need to. You can eat some seeds. Maybe you'll even find some honey or some fruit, which would be more desirable. But the majority of those foods, especially the leaves and the seeds and the roots, are generally considered quote unquote fallback foods by anthropologists, by zoologists. Meat, the Hadza will tell you this, meat is what they want. Meat and organs is what they want. And they'll take honey too. So really their favorite foods are meat, organs, and honey. And everything else is kind of a fallback food. It's a survival food, not the this is our best, most desirable food. So we find ourselves, and this kind of hints or foreshadows an ethical discussion, which we can have later in the podcast if you would like. In 2021, we find ourselves some of the apex predators on the planet. We are the apex predator. I can eat meat every single day. I can have a successful hunt every single day. Ethically, should I? I believe there are lots of ways to justify the ethics of eating meat and having successful hunts every single day. But that's an important question to ask. You know, ethically, should we have successful hunts every day? I believe yes, mm. um, because it helps us thrive as humans. And we can go into that later in, in the podcast. And it helps us do the work and the art that we're meant to do as humans. Um, but we are in this unique position where I don't have to draw my bow every day to get the best food on the planet. So the title of my book was almost apex predator. Um, mm. And, you know, I thought, oh, my friends were like, oh, that's too intense. You don't want to be, that's like, you know, that's like the movie Predator or something. You don't want to, the book shouldn't be called Apex Predator. I was like, well, it's kind of true. Like humans are the apex predator. Um, so that's that's quite interesting to consider. And it's just the idea that we can, we can send our body the signal of abundance every single day. And I think we should. And there are a lot of longevity pundits, we can talk about this too if you'd like, who say, no, no, you shouldn't send your body the signal of abundance every day. And I said, that's bullshit. Like, there's no evidence, there's no good evidence that meat shortens our lives, that meat ages us, that meat does any of those things. That, you know, basically what happens when you're a successful hunter is you get ripped, you get healthy, you get horny, <laughs> and you get happy. Right. And so, <laughs> if you don't, I mean, I don't know, I mean, if anybody doesn't want to like be those a good things, formula, yeah, for longevity. yeah, it's, it's like a pretty good formula, right? Like, uh, yeah. even if somebody could make some esoteric hand waving argument, which I don't think you really can, that not eating meat or that by not being those things you're going to live a few weeks longer, who the hell would want to anyway? I want to live happy and healthy and jacked and you know, right? Yeah, agreed, like, man. Fertile. I don't want to be decrepit. The, yes. Yeah. So there's, there's lots there. Yeah, there's lots there yeah. we could go. I'll let you I'll let you take it from here. Um uh, it's awesome, man. Uh, one of my other que a question I had a little bit earlier which you pre I think you touched on was do you feel like there's one food plan for every human being? Do you feel like the carnivore code or the animal-based uh way of eating could work for everybody. So this is a this is always the super loaded question. Um, I know, I know. Is, I just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the answer is the answer is no. The answer is no, um, and I will qualify that. Um, I believe that as humans, an animal based diet is as close to a species appropriate diet as we can get, and I don't believe that the same foods are going to work for every individual. But I think that certain principles <clears throat> will generally apply to the vast majority of individuals and help them reach optimal health. You know, with Heart and Soil, which is the company that I built that actually makes desiccated organs. So we talked earlier about liver and how beautiful it is. And the other organs of animals are so beautiful. They're so nutrient rich, but a lot of people don't want to eat liver. So at Heart and Soil, we make desiccated. We make freeze-dried organs and capsules for people. Mm. And one of our, our, our sort of our, our message is reclaim your birthright to radical health. And I think that we all have a birthright 
to radical health. And so I believe that these principles will help people reclaim that. And those principles are things we've talked about earlier. Meat and organs are the most sought after foods on the planet. Eat them, make them the majority of your diet. Do not be fearful based on shitty science. Look at evolution and look at the good science that I present in my other work, actual interventional studies with meat and organs. Number two, religiously avoid things like seed oils, which are completely evolutionarily inconsistent. And number three, understand that plant foods exist on a toxicity spectrum, and not all plant foods are entirely benign for all humans. Now, ultimately, what I think I'm doing and what you're doing is trying to help people get back to a higher quality of life, the birthright to radical health. And so if somebody is eating salad or they're eating broccoli and they are thriving, who am I to tell them to stop doing that? If you're thriving, don't change anything. Keep doing what you're doing. And even within right. an animal-based diet, I think that people giving up broccoli and kale, they will feel better. They'll fart less. They'll have less bloating. Their poops will be better. <laughs> they'll have less joint pain, right? Maybe like me, they'll have less eczema. But within an animal-based diet, I don't think everybody's going to eat the exact same foods. Some people might like strawberries or bananas, or some people might be in Costa Rica and they're going to eat papayas or honey. Some people may not like honey or they may not, they may find that it doesn't work for them. Or some people may prefer sweet potatoes, which I would consider to be moderate rather than totally, rather than completely least toxic. So I wanna give people a spectrum and a, and a template from which to build a diet that works for them. I don't really eat a lot of avocados, but I think that they're a, a fruit and people could incorporate them in their diet. So I don't think there's one food by food specific diet for humans, but I think there are principles that will help the vast majority of people really reclaim that birthright to freaking amazing health. And the asterisk on that statement is that some people who are already sick need to modify these recommendations. These are people like with chronic kidney disease. If you have chronic kidney disease, your kidneys aren't gonna process as much protein as I recommend. You need to talk to your doctor about it. You're not gonna be able to eat one gram of protein per pound of gold body weight, which I set as a minimum for people. So one pound of meat equals 100 grams of protein. And so for somebody like me, I'm 170 pounds. I'm gonna eat 170 to 200 grams of protein today and every day. And I think that's a minimum for people. Now, if you have mm. chronic kidney disease, maybe you had diabetes or longstanding hypertension, you're not going to be able to eat that much protein. Maybe you've had a nephrectomy. Maybe you don't have both of your kidneys. You're going to have to lower your protein requirements and increase your carbohydrates or increase your fat. So it's not, so there are some pre-existing medical conditions. People with longstanding diabetes, are probably going to want to avoid a ton of fruit and honey in the beginning and make sure that they eliminate seed oils. And then over time, they can reincorporate fruit. So pre-existing medical conditions will make this a nuanced way of introduction of this way of eating and may make certain modifications of it better for certain people. But generally, I'm about sharing with people these principles that I talked about. Meat is yeah. amazing. Don't fear it. Avoid seed oils understand that not all plants are great for you. And I think that is gonna work for most people because we are all homo sapiens. And the last thing I'll say is this, I do not believe that there are some people who are born to be vegans, <laughs> unless they're a whole new species, <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that, that went away with Paranthropus, right? Like right, I right. do not believe that there are homo sapiens on this planet that will thrive as vegans. And people will say, well, what about this vegan or that vegan who's thriving? And if you really look at those cases, what you find time and time again is they're either lying about what they're eating, mm. they're taking a ton of supplements, a ton right. of supplements, a ton of synthetic proteins, which don't exist in nature, whether it's hemp or pea protein, it's hydrolyzed, and they are, or they are, they are partway to their vegan journey, and then within three to five years, they nutritionally uh, crater, and they end up as a flaming mess of people, of nutritional sort of, like a big nutritional debacle. And so the thing I'll just add here is that people might, whenever I say this, you know, well, the vegans are taking tons of supplements, but you make supplements, Paul, with heart and soil. The supplements we make are food. We are freeze drying right. food in a capsule so you guys can get more organs, which is different than taking peas or hemp and hydrolyzing it and making a concentrated form of the pea protein. Those are very different right. things. Most of the pea and hemp proteins come out of China. They're highly toxic and metals, and then they're taking a ton of other synthetic supplements, which don't even come from food, B12, et cetera, et cetera. So they're basically, they're, they're, they're just leaning on crutches everywhere, and then they don't actually thrive long-term. And many of these people, bless their heart, I think that they're well-intentioned vegans, 
have never tried a well-constructed animal-based diet. They, they, I think that most of them are well-intentioned, not all of them, but most of them are. Most of them believe they are trying to help people, but most of them have never done the opposite. They've never tried to eat non-processed foods and meat and seen how much better they would feel. <laughs> Uh, most right. of them come from a position of saying, oh, my previous diet was a bunch of junk food. And then I went on this vegan diet. It felt great. Yeah, of course, you're going to feel great when you cut out processed foods from your diet. But you could feel right. even better. You know, there's ways to yeah. feel even better. So that's yeah. my answer to your question. Oh, it's awesome, man. Um, I'm curious about I was going to ask you about thriving vegans and what they looked like and you answered that i pretty much what i thought um i'm curious about food combinations how you feel about that eating you know like eating fruit and meat and honey or how you do it what fruits do you eat um what does a day of your eating look like um yeah, I think that I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, so what works for me is not going to work for everyone. Of course. Um, uh, but I, I, I start, I construct my food around meat and organs. I generally eat two to three meals a day. And right now, I get up every morning and I surf. And so uh, all the plant-based people will love that I'm, I'm plant-based and vegan till about 9.30 in the morning or 10 o'clock. I get up, I get up, I drink a few coconuts, I eat a couple of bananas and I go surf. So I'm plant-based until 10 a.m. And then I come okay. back and I eat a pound of meat. And then I come back and eat a pound of meat. <laughs> All the meat that I eat is grass-fed and grass-finished and regeneratively raised. Come back and I eat a pound of meat. I eat about an ounce of liver, maybe a couple of ounces of heart. If I don't have access to heart and liver, I will use our desiccated supplements from heart and soil. Um, and then I'll eat some more fruit and maybe a little bit of honey with my quote unquote breakfast. And for me, I've found that 100, 200 grams of carbohydrates a day seems to be a sweet spot for me. I don't count calories. I don't count my macros other than the fact that I know that I feel best if I get a couple of ounces of organs a day and a couple of pounds of meat per day, right? So two pounds of meat and maybe two ounces of organs a day seems great. And that's why I consider this animal-based. I'm constructing my diet around animal foods. The plant foods are accoutrements. They're, they're, they're just for flavor, they're for carbohydrates, but they're not the majority of what I eat. And then throughout the day, I don't really snack. Maybe, maybe I snack a little bit and I'll have another banana, maybe another coconut if it's a hot day. And then I'll sometimes eat a second meal, but usually it's, recently it's been about two meals a day. Uh, and the second meal is usually four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And again, it's another meat feast. It's another pound plus of meat, um, some fruit and some honey. And for me, I've found that fruit like uh, papaya and banana works really well. I try to find yeah. the fruit that I can get organic. Uh, again, I live in the tropics right now. I live in Costa Rica, so I can get papaya, I can get avocado, I can get bananas organic. I can get pineapples, those are the fruit that I eat. And then I can get local raw organic honey, which I eat as well. If I'm in the States, it's very hard to get tropical fruit. So I might eat more bananas, I might eat seasonal berries. Uh, maybe I'll eat watermelon. Uh, I'll eat watermelon here too when I can get it. So, and again, people are gonna have to figure out what works for them in terms of what fruits are available, what type of um, situation they're in. And there's questions, you know, should humans eat seasonally? Should humans eat via latitude? There's a lot of questions and see what works. In terms of food combining, maybe that's ideal to only eat your food separately, but I think logistically it's so hard for most people that I don't even uh -huh. really worry about it. You know, I don't uh -huh. really have a lot of GI distress or gas with eating fruit and meat together. If people find that digest, they digest fruit better separately than meat, do that. If you find that you digest uh, meat best by itself, do that, that's fine. Certainly if you're out hunting and gathering with the Hadza and you kill an animal, you bring it back to camp and you usually just eat that animal. So you might just eat one fruit at a time. Right. If we're out there on the hunt and they find a hive, they're gonna eat honey with nothing else, just honey and honey and honey. If we find berries, we're gonna eat berries with nothing else. So there are, there are precedents for you know, not combining a lot of foods, but I think most people will be fine eating blueberries and steak together. 
Um, it's not the end of the world, but if they feel better eating them separately, I think that works too. That's awesome, man. Um, what, what would you say are things to be mindful of that would be great markers for something not working? For instance, a lot of gas or pain in the gut or what are some of those markers that people can become mindful of, turn on to, to have a good sense of what they're eating and how it's working in their system? I think you hit on a lot of them. It would be things like GI symptoms primarily, gas, farting, bloating, GI pain, uh, constipation, diarrhea. Start with those. You should be oh. able to eat food and then sit next to your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your husband or your wife or your kids and not fart on them and go into a movie theater <laughs> and drive your car with the windows up. You know, uh, yeah. lots of gas is, is not normal for humans. Um, and then I think, you know, joint pain, like you mentioned, mood swings, insomnia, worsening of rashes, uh, mm. all of these things, fatigue, brain fog. All of these things can be an indication that something is not right with what you're eating. And so many times I think people feel all of these things or medicate so many of these things with actual medications right. or with things like coffee or alcohol, that they've dulled their senses. They don't even know how they feel or they, they sort of right. have this baseline, which is so low that they don't understand how good they could feel. But start with the GI symptoms and then go from there. But I think people, like I said, I love this term birthright. I think that as humans, yeah. we all have a birthright. To, to get up, to have energy, to have mental clarity, to have a good mood when we wake up, to have a positive outlook, to have a healthy libido, and then to have yeah. energy throughout the day, to sleep well, and to be able to do the things we wanna do in the day that, are, that involve strength and bending without joint pain or fatigue or, or massive GI discomfort. So we all have the birthright to actually enjoy our lives. That's what it's about. I love that. I love that. Amen, brother. Uh, last thing I want to ask you about, because this has been so epic and uh, I think just people are going to get so much out of this. So somebody is down to eat meat and, but they're going, you know, I hear a lot of fucked up things about industrial meat farming, or I'm not sure if I need to be organic grass fed or what. What do I need to do? I want to eat meat, but I'm looking, what's the best quality and what's the difference and what do I want to look out for when I'm buying my meat? Yeah, I think the ethical questions are super important. And I'll just, I'll frame it with this statement that though many of us can abstain, I'm sure not, not all of us do, but uh, many of us can abstain or choose to abstain from voting in the political system, we cannot choose to abstain we cannot abstain from voting with our dollars. So right. this is a really powerful concept for me. When you go to the grocery store and you buy meat and food, you are either voting for small, grass-fed, grass-finished, regenerative farmers, or you are voting for multinational corporations like Unilever, Cargill, Monsanto, uh, et cetera. Uh, and right. so you just need to decide who you are voting for um, with your dollars. And I think that, that for myself and many others, it is worth paying more to vote for a future that we believe in. I understand that meat is expensive for people and a lot of my stuff actually addresses how to eat animal-based for very affordable amounts of money. Um, but there are lots of ways to get grass-fed, grass-finished, and preferably regeneratively raised meat um, within the country. There are lots of uh, e-commerce providers. There's a farm in Georgia called White Oak Pastures. There's Belcampo, there's a place called Primal yeah. Pastures in California. There's lots of this and it's growing. And regeneratively raised meat is basically the complete opposite of a factory farm. It's rotational mm -hmm. grazing, meaning the cows are on a field and then they move to a whole new field in a few days. And then they move to a whole new field and they're rotationally grazing them while they're grass feeding and grass finishing. And what we know is when you raise animals that way, when you raise ruminants, whether it's, whether it's sheep or goats, or cows, or bison in that way, because of the way the animals interact with the grassland, they actually enrich the grassland. They make it more fertile. This is actually really fascinating and where the term regenerate comes from. They are regenerating grassland. You can find fields that have been destroyed by monocrop agriculture. 
And very few people appreciate the way that monocrop agriculture is so bad for the land. When you till the land, mm, you are destroying right. mycorrhizal networks in the soil. You are destroying ecosystems diversity by monocropping land. But regenerative agriculture increases biodiversity, increases mycorrhizal networks, recreates ecosystems, and sequesters more carbon than it produces into the soil. So it obviates any arguments of carbon emissions from cattle because they are net zero or net negative carbon producers in that environment, which is a fascinating mm. thing. So yeah. I think that you have a choice who you vote for, um, but you can't really have your cake and eat it too in this situation. You can't say meat is too expensive, uh, but I don't want to eat you know, factory farmed meat. It's like, well, you need to support meat that is, you know, that is, that is equally valued as you are and, and support yeah. that type of meat. And it's not, having said that, it's not astronomically more expensive, but it is more expensive, but it's also quality. Nutritionally, it is different. There have been lots of studies showing that grass feeding and grass finishing is, is more nutritionally uh, replete than grain fed animals. And there's a number of studies by Fred Provenza and Stefan Van Villiet showing that it has many nutrients more uh, glutathione, other chemicals in the meat than grain finished meat. And it also, the benefits of grass feeding and grass finishing are also in what the meat doesn't have in it. Because if you are feeding a cow right. grass for 85% of its life and then feeding it grains at the end, you are feeding it generally moldy grains that are sprayed with pesticides. And mm. in order to feed these cows grains, depending where in the world you are, they're also allowed to feed them food scraps and bits of plastic and uh, cookies and all kinds of crap is going into these cows that is going to accumulate, whether it's glyphosate or wow. other pesticides or atrazine or mold toxins on the moldy grains that these cows are being fed. So like, and then people are like, oh, the cows have hormones and they have antibiotics. Well, uh, grass feeding and grass finishing and regeneratively raising animals doesn't do any of that. So you can eat a Franken cow, but I don't think you want to. And so many of the plant-based arguments are saying, well, we don't want to eat this horrible meat. And they, I think that they lose the reality that there's so much more meat available that's much better and is actually way better for the planet and way better for our environment than the monocropped plants that they're eating, that they think right. are so good for, you know, like, I don't know what plant-based people are thinking, but the monocropped plants that you are eating are destroying ecosystems massively. So there's a lot of hypocrisy there. I don't think it's intentional. I just think it's ignorance. Sure. Oh, Paul, you're the fucking man, dude. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of this, for your time, um, for dropping your, your knowledge and your wisdom and food. It's let food be thy medicine, man. Huh? I mean, fuck. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's powerful. The last thing I... The last thing I wanted to say, I didn't get to say this, but just to uh, just to further praise the power of liver, I was watching this this uh, nature documentary with my daughter the other day about orcas, and orcas will literally seek out the liver of anything they eat. They'll kill great whites and only eat the liver out of the great whites because the liver is so prized. It's so nutrient dense and it'll feed the entire family of fucking orcas to eat these liver. And it's, it was, it kind of blew my mind cause I'd gotten on the liver kick and then I watched this documentary and I was like, fucking the most, one of the most badass animals on the planet seeks out liver because it knows how nutritious it is. It was powerful. Um, most animals do that. Most, sure, uh, most right. omnivorous That's what I was animals say. that eat other animals. Yeah. Like you look, and you see the, all, the, yeah. all, all the videos of any, any predators in Africa when they've got the kill, they're fucking right there in the guts, man, eating the fucking organs, the liver, the kidneys, the heart, all that shit. So it's so... Yep. You know, I even, I love the taste, man. It's so mineral and it tastes like the earth when you eat, when you eat some good liver, it's like, fuck, this stuff tastes like it's got nutrients in it. And I know it a lot of people definitely are does. a little, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, dude, thank you again. Let everybody know, I'll, I'll have it all in the show notes, but let everybody know where they can listen to your podcast, get your book, follow you on Instagram, all that good stuff. 
So the first place I think for people to go is heartandsoil.co. Um, that's where we sell the desiccated organs, but that's also where you can link to my book, links to podcasts, links to lots of free resources there. We do free 30-day animal-based challenges there. My podcast is called Fundamental Health. Uh, that's available everywhere that it's not censored. Um, depending on the episode, it, it sometimes gets taken down because Jesus Christ. We're, we live in a we live in an information uh, a strange information uh, environment in 2021. And then I'm at Carnivore ND on all the socials, but lots of free resources for people at all those spots and the desiccated organs if people want to get more liver or other organs because even beyond liver, the other organs are so nutritious. Like, uh, have you ever tried eating testicle? That's what you got to try next. That's that's the J. <laughs> testicle is amazing. All yeah. right, brother. You heard it here. Testicles and liver, man. The the, the fountain of youth. It's um, about as good as it gets, man. You're the man, dude. I got to I got to try some of these supplements too or or some of these food capsules. I'm definitely going to check those out myself. Um well, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for your time. And uh, I'd love to do another jam session down the line to get more more into the nitty gritty of all of these topics. But I think that was a great, great foundation for people looking to looking to optimize their, their health and their life. Absolutely, I appreciate man, you guys. Awesome, man. Awesome. I appreciate you guys listening. Thank you so much for your support. Hope you got as much out of that as I did. Lots of love to all of you. I'll see y'all on the flip side. Peace.